Hey everyone, this is Les from Anthropotamus. Next month, from November 17th through November 21st, anthropologists from around the world will gather in Baltimore and online for the American Anthropological Association's hybrid annual meeting. Whether you're presenting your research or learning about new developments in your specialty, the annual meeting is the place to grow as an anthropologist. We have a lot to talk about, so join the conversation and help shape the field and advance your career. Strict health and safety guideline protocols will be in place for those attending in person, but there will also be a lot of virtual and live streamed events, as well as view on demand participation. Register by going to the association's website at AmericanAnthro.org. Again, that's AmericanAnthro.org. Hi everyone, I'm Les. And I'm Ashley. And you're listening to Anthropotamus, where we explore some of your favorite anthropology topics. Hey everyone, welcome to a new episode of Anthropotamus. Today we are reviewing Wisdom from a Rainforest by Stuart Schlegel. Well, let me just start by saying that this is um, definitely one of my uh, one of my favorite books. Um, the author, Stuart Schlegel, put a quote at the beginning of the, the book here, and it, I feel like it encapsulates the tone of the book very well. But here's the quote. It's by... William Butler Yeats, from The Second Coming. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, surely some revelation is at hand. And I think the reason that he put that quote in there is most of the book speaks in depth about the culture and the things that he learned about them, the things that he loved about them, while the world continues on outside. And a society that was the way this one was, this small egalitarian society, could not persist in the world that was growing around it. The center could not hold, and it did eventually... It, it fell in. Yeah, so I loved the bo- this book. And I just want to say to the listeners, uh, when we first started planning this podcast, it was, what, almost three years ago now? Uh, uh, before the too. Yeah, before the pandemic hit, we got, you know, less recommend this book. We both ended up loving it. And we were really hoping to have our first episode about this book and the author. And unfortunately... I think by the time we finally read the book and we're planning to start recording, we found out that the author passed away and was very unfortunate. And it was a bit saddening because I actually really did enjoy this book. But I don't know what my point is. Point is, this is a great book. It's a Um, great book and it's a celebration. It was written as a celebration of life. It was, let's, uh, Let's discuss it and let's celebrate that life. That's right. We should. We should celebrate this this book. Um, you know, my my great grandfather is actually from the Philippines. So if you you know, this book is about a tribe in the Philippines, um, mid nineteen hundreds. Um, what I found it's because I don't I you know my great grandfather was from the Philippines. He ended up coming to the U S. and marrying like this little white woman from Oklahoma. She was a little. She was actually taller than him. He was a little guy. <laughs> But I don't know anything about my, you know, heritage on his side of the family. So reading about this was very interesting for me. And um, my my dad's side of the family is very religious. But I found it, thinking as my dad's side of the family, I think of them as being, you know, very religious, Christian. But then it talks about how Christianity didn't really have a strong hold on the Philippines and the tribes until, you know, going into the 1900s. So I was a little surprised because... You know, um, well, you know, the spread of Christianity throughout the world and all that. So that was, I I mean, I guess I just always imagined that my dad's side of the family, especially my, I guess I just imagined my grandfather to have, and his family to have already a a history of being Christians when it's possible his family may have been something else in the early 1900s. 
Well, there were quite a few um, different uh, invasions of the Philippines and takeovers, reinstitution of um, different governments. Uh, they, they went through a whole cornucopia of um, religious uh, restriction. So it could have been a number of things. Um, the Spanish was in control of the land and they were, uh, I believe, Muslim. It was their mm -hmm. official religion. Um, oh, geez. The, once the United States took over, they were... We had a lot of um, Mormon missionaries, and I think that's where this uh, this book comes in. Um, yeah, just a, a lot of different uh, intermixing of, of religions and religious teachings were put into this area. Right. It just kind of seemed like the whole religion aspect of the country was just kind of a hot mess. And <laughs> they were just all still trying to figure out what they were. Um, but... But also very interesting about the book was that he brought his whole family over here. I mean, his whole, and I, I, I wish this is something I wish we could get into greater depth about is how his wife was able to come to this new country. I mean, he, he left her in the village with the children while she homeschooled them while he was away in the forest, you know, for, for writing, months at a time, for months at a time. And I, I mean, for her to, do that i mean the incredible support she gave him so he could do this but also i mean the cultural shock and she must have gone through um i think would be a very interesting read i wonder if she has written the book i, I don't think i've looked into that that would be an intro that would we should look into be that, very yeah. interesting okay note to self note look to self look. wife <laughs> <laughs> um so we should also mention that the 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 book itself is an ethnography, uh, written, like I said, as a love letter to the the culture and the culture that we're talking about in particular. The people that he studied and wrote the ethnography on were called the Magindanon, um, and they lived in an egalitarian village outside of the um, the centralized industrial population. So, so what uh, what other things can you uh, this did stood out to you? Oh well, the um, the intro story was uh, was pretty um, impactful. Are you referring to his son getting sick? Yeah, yeah, and the way that they uh, the way that the the Magindanon treated him and his son in their concerns, um, while still at the same time adhering to their own uh, cultures and their their knowledge right uh he talks about how he himself knew that his son was sick they needed western medicine they needed to get back to the city so he could be taken care of while the shaman uh who was leading the group decided that he was just going to take care of the problem and he started to commune with the the spirit the the angry spirit that was um causing the problem while at the same time you know while he, he was taking care of the this this spirit um the villagers themselves organized a group to basically carry the the child Stuart's child back into town for him um fording rivers during a storm and they went to an extraordinary amount of effort to bring him back to the city so that he could get well, even though they did not believe that that was the proper way to handle the illness. Um, and this was all because, you know, he was, you know, they were human and they had needs and wants. They were considerate of that. Something I hadn't realized now until you brought that up is this book actually begins and ends with his son. Yeah, that's a good point. And I don't, I don't want to say what happens at the end of the book, but um, I, 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 that's something I have to think about now about why he, he did decide to to, to begin and end the book with his son. Yeah. I feel like it has a lot more meaning now, now that I now realize that he realize. did that. Second reads are always fantastic, especially when you like the book. Yeah, I, sh I should. Maybe maybe this summer we'll go ahead and reread this book. Yeah. So another thing that really stood out to me was um, 
the I believe it's chapter three. All animals that can fly are birds. I was just thinking the same thing when it was uh, referring to bats as birds. Mm -hmm. I really liked. I mean, that's that's something you don't think about. You're like, well, bats aren't birds. That's just to us. That's a fact, right? But that's just what you know. How we've decided how to categorize animals. I mean, we kind of, we determine the parameters in which, you know, what animals belong in which group. And it, to see how they simplified it and how they, I mean, it's a way, in, it's a way to see how they perceive the world. And, you know, maybe we don't need to make things as complicated as we do. Yeah, yeah, we definitely um, could simplify um, but at the same time, the, the level of, um, knowledge that we built based on, you know, our research and our findings is it, you know, it's an incredible amount. I mean, you, you can, um, you can point at a lot of things and pretty much anything you point at now, we know something about, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that's fantastic. That's a wonderful thing. Um, there is something to be said about simplification, though. I mean, like in the like they say in in that chapter, you know, all you know, the chapter, all animals that are bird that, that can fly are birds. Um, they mention how if they're in the sky, that's a category of themselves, right? I mean, they're not they're not walking on the ground. Why would we call them, you know? Why would we call them anything but a bird? You know, it can fly around. Um, I don't remember if they mentioned insects, but I'm curious as to whether or not they would quantify mm -hmm. something like a butterfly as a bird. As, yeah, as a bird. That would be interesting. interesting. <clears throat> something... I wish I could remember more detail about this, but something I had enjoyed in the book, because it's been... I mean, it's been a while since I've read it, but... There was this whole part about marriage, and wasn't there a part where the family of the groom traveled all the way over to marry his bride? I wish I could go into more detail of it. I actually really enjoyed the, the which funny is I really enjoyed, I remember enjoying this part of the book, but I can't even remember much about it. It was a little while ago that you read it. Um, it was longer since I read it, but I did reread. Um, I know what you're talking about. I don't remember exactly the specific story, but, um, that does raise a point that, uh, I, I believe the, the point of that, um, portion was that the author was discussing marriage law in the area. That was the, the whole reason that he, um, he got his grant was to, uh, you know, learn about and study their their marriage laws and how that worked. And one of the most interesting parts about it was the memory that all of the shamans or not, well, there were specific people whose job it was to just remember things. And he was talking about how you could find an elder who had memorized something the the, uh, the bridal it, gifts from yeah the, the dowry and yeah. everything that was given um which i thought was crazy like how do you remember and i think part of it is you know we're talking about a society that doesn't necessarily i don't i don't think they had a writing system right mm -hmm. so they yeah. had to remember everything mm -hmm. orally so i'm i'm sure they've you know their brains are basically better adapt at remembering stuff unlike us who we just constantly rely on writing things down but I, at the same time, I thought it was crazy. Like, how do you remember the details of a dowry gift gift for everyone in the village for years? Not just years, decades. Decades, and then you have these people who are, I guess, in our our sense, getting divorced and remarrying, and then now you have to remember. You know, you have to give exactly every single piece back for, for it that, to be a peaceful transition, right? And that for that particular marriage, and can you imagine if you were kept getting divorced, then that 
poor poor old man had to keep remembering the dowry to all your marriages and what you had to give back. Well, that was his specialization. And it that's was. another interesting point is they were talking about how every person had, was able to decide their specialization and what they would do best. And um, the there was, there was a certain amount of prestige that came with being um, somebody who remembered those things somebody who is a um i can't remember what the the name for their job was but um somebody who actually spent time actively memorizing wedding gifts and everything else like that they, they had a very prestigious place in that society another thing is um he talks about his his life transitioning back to the U.S. and I, I, I believe what was it the um, was it California State Santa Cruz or University of Santa Cruz? I don't remember what school it was. Mm -hmm. It was Santa Cruz, though, wasn't it? Uh, I I don't remember for sure. I want to. I could be wrong, but I could have sworn it was Santa Cruz that he was a professor at. Um, but I mean, just to, to imagine, I mean, he spent so much time living with this tribe and having to switch back into you know you know, Western civilization and then transitioning into being a professor. Um, I mean, I guess to me, just imagining the thought, the way of thinking you had to go, the change in the way you thought that process you had to go through transition back into, you know, living here in the U S and how I guess I just imagine how much conflict he had to have to go within himself in dealing mm -hmm. with, you know, other Westerners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that um, that right there is the core of culture shock, isn't it? You know, you, uh, you become part of a society that you don't actually belong to um, and can never really belong to because you are... Well, you don't, you, you're an outsider. And then now going back into being, you know, in the Western civilization, it's like, well, do I really belong here now? And I think this is kind of a, and I guess I think of this too also as someone who's deployed is you go on deployment and then you come back and you, the things that were important to you before aren't necessarily that important anymore. And you have to reframe your way of thinking to fit back in again. I mean, all I have to say say about the book is that I really enjoyed it. I uh, I wish the author was still around. I would love to talk to him more about it. Um, and uh, I really recommend it. It was, and you know what? Um, if our authors haven't, or our authors, our listeners haven't noticed already, I purposely usually pick books that are short because of my short attention span. Um, so typically if it's a book more than 200 pages, it's probably one that less, less picked out. Um, but yeah. I, this is, this is this book besides the topic being extremely interesting. It's very well written and easy to follow. Um, so I'm, I think that with my short attention span, if, Actually, I think we both have a pretty short attention span, but <laughs> if if we're saying go buy this book, <laughs> it's a pretty darn good book. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned before, uh, and I'll mention it again, I am an avid reader. Um, I read all kinds of things, but mostly what I prefer is, you know, novels and fiction work. This was a break away from, from my, my normal reading, and I just absolutely loved it um i i think i read this somewhere around 10 years ago <laughs> um originally and you know i i just i still go back to it i reference it i um talk to people about people about it and some of the things that um they discuss have had a huge impact on my life um the way that they the maginanon viewed luck is one that I constantly come back to. Uh, it, to. To break it down, 
to its most simple components, the way that they thought of luck was um, every person has a, a finite amount of bad luck. And every time something bad happens, it was a time to celebrate because that means that you're one step closer to having no more bad luck in your life. <laughs> and I just thought that was the coolest ideology that I'd come across. Which is funny. Is I think I think of it in the same way. Well, today I've been at a really unlucky day, so tomorrow must not be unlucky. <laughs> you see, there you go. It, it's it's a very positive framework to to, to start from. Any any final thoughts, Les? Yeah, I mean, I, I I'll say it. I'll say it now, and I'll say it again. I cannot recommend this book enough. I have tried to push this book on every person who has showed a vague interest in. Uh, in anthropology since I read it and um, I'll continue to do so. Uh, I didn't get to live with the Magaindanan. I didn't get to meet any of them in person but I think that through this work I fell in love with their culture almost as much as the original author did. Thank you all for listening. Distribution of Anthropotamus is in collaboration with the American Anthropological Association. Please continue to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Anthropotamus for our latest episodes, show notes, and book discussion schedule.